Welcome again. Thanks for joining us on Sunday night. Um, we've been studying the end times and we've kind of switched gears. Uh, last week we started uh, talking about um, Christians or another word for Christians is the term saints. Uh, tonight's message is actually entitled Saints Becoming More Than Christians. If you would pray with me, please. Father God, we thank you again, Lord, for your goodness and faithfulness with us, your people, your kids. Father, we thank you that you've given us so much, Lord. And Lord, you desire us to um, pass that forward, Lord, to give others the good news and uh, lead them to you, Father. We just ask tonight, God, that you would join us and teach us new things so that we could apply them to our own lives and leave here as changed Christians becoming saints. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I have a quote here, first of all, tonight. Um, it's by Soren Kierkegaard. I would imagine that's a little German. And it states here by Soren, God creates out of nothing, but he does what is still more wonderful. He makes saints out of sinners. I talked last Sunday how <clears throat> there have been times in my life I've gotten a little irritated with so many people identifying with uh, the word sinners uh, because I think the enemy in our flesh does well enough to remind us of uh, what we're capable of doing in our old lifestyles. So at first glance tonight, you may struggle with that title or that word or term, saints, but becoming more than Christians is what it's all about. Please understand that I'm not arguing against the term Christian, the truth be told, it is not, um, it becomes too familiar sometimes or too cheap. Um, the words Jesus and Christ are ambiguous in speech, especially um, not always in a good sense. As Westerners, or those living in the United States, we are more and less all cultural Christians, especially in the conservative uh, pockets of our society nowadays. But the collective identity of Christians has kind of become homogenized and turned into a unrecognizable kind of gruel. You know, the lunch stuff that some mothers plop on their plate of terrified children thinking they have to eat it. You see, the food is certainly inclusive, but when kids look at it, it lacks form or definition because it is every, everything. Thousands of different leftovers may be left over from the days prior to that. It's combined, but yet nothing. And sadly, the term Christian suffers the same fate. I suggest looking somewhere else for a term that captures the mystery of our new life in Christ, our personal true self. Now, while the term or identifier of Christian is used, as I mentioned last week, only three times in the New Testament, uh, it's because it is everything to thousands of believers um, but it is translated from the Greek word hagios, translated as the, into the word saints. And it's used then, the word saints, over 60 times. According to the HarperCollins Bible Dictionary, the word hagios refers to those whose relationship with God is maintained through faith in Jesus Christ. And at first glance, this definition doesn't seem any different from what you would call a Christian. But based on this accurate yet incomplete definition, every person who 
has a relationship with faith in God through Jesus Christ is then considered a saint. I have a quote. It goes like this. You do not have to be born with stars over your crib. All of us are invited to enjoy this ever-growing faith-empowered relationship with the one who is life and capitalize one, uh, O-N-E, and capitalize life, L-I-F-E. You see, the invitation to be a saint was a vital part of the early church's language and identity. And that is why the Apostle Paul often uh, began his letters by addressing his audience as saints. Listen to what Romans 1, 7, it says, To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and, pe and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 2, Unto the church which is in Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ, Jesus called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. And then Colossians 1, 2, which says, To the saints and the faithful brothers in Christ at Coloss. Just by surveying those three verses, we can surmise that all of us are called to be saints. And when God calls us to do and become something, he provides the means like any good father. God doesn't enjoy watching us flounder, but he does give us space and opportunity to learn and grow. And what's kind of mind-boggling is that we get to partner with God as we discover the depths of his plans for us. These verses also show us death, which I know nobody really likes to talk about, that death is not a prerequisite for sainthood. Not only can we become saints in this lifetime, not after we die, but we are also expected to embrace this identity and bring its corresponding reality to this world, this lost and dying world around us. While I like the Harper Collins Bible Dictionary's definition, I'm really not a fan of their use of the word maintained. You see, it refers to those whose relationship with God is maintained through faith in Jesus Christ. A relationship can't be maintained through faith. I think the words grown or enlarged or awakened should replace maintained. And basically, I'm looking for something expansive, something that changes and grows. After all, the life, life should not be about maintenance. It is about expansion and a small view of this journey in Christ to realize who we really are in Christ is responsible for the lack of imagination and transformation found in becoming a Christian today. You see, I'm... I'm certainly found this to be true in my own life. The baseline definition of hagios is a personal relationship with God through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. You see, if you don't have that as the foundation, there cannot be that part of becoming a saint. There's nothing wrong with that primary definition. We cannot experience the life God has for us without first recognizing and embracing this foundation. But there is actually more, way more to being a saint. The Tyndale Bible Dictionary adds that saints 
are the people of the coming age. In other words, a saint is someone who brings a future reality into the present. They transcend the problems and the limitations of the temporal by embracing and partnering with the eternal. They find elements of the promised life of God's coming age, the age when God is known and seen by all and by partnering with God, spirit. You see, they bring evidence of that age into very real problems and opportunities in our world today. Saints are not people who escape the real world, living detached from the struggles of life. No, to become a saint is to become profoundly human. It is to feel what God feels for the world. It, is empowered, it will empower us to be aligned with his actions, with his heart. It's to embrace God's nature and to step into the fullness of us becoming a new creation. You see, the Son of God became a man to make men and women sons and daughters of God. And saints have caught a glimpse of who they are in Christ. They possess a hope and a confidence in God's promises to make all things new and purposefully work with his spirit to bring that future reality into the present. You see, prior to Jesus' death, the evidence of heaven's reality was limited for the most part to the temple. Think about this. Only the priests were granted access to what was then heaven's micro cosm on earth but now God's people his saints are his temple and everywhere you and I go we can bring a little bit of heaven's reality with us listen to what 1 Corinthians 3 16 and 17 says you do not know that you are the temple of the living God and that God's spirit dwells in you God's temple is holy and you are that temple you see when we awaken to the spirit's work in our lives we create thin places spots where the veil between the two dimensions of heaven and earth is incredibly thin spots where God's final word becomes evident in our world. Our prayer that we have repeated since we were all kids on earth as it is in heaven becomes a reality. And when I reference to heaven, please don't think that I'm just talking about a celestial city up there in the heavens. You see, we as saints can experience many of heaven's realities, such as peace and joy and togetherness and forgiveness and love and mercy and wholeness and, and justice and so on. You get the picture. We can have all that in our lives today, revealing heaven to a world that is desperate for something more. You see, heaven is indeed a real place in a different, different dimension. And I'm not saying that isn't uh, important. Remember that Jesus did tell the criminal that we looked at last week that on that day he would join him. On that day he would have salvation and that he would be in paradise with Jesus. But God's plan has always been to bring heaven to earth. You see, that is the end goal as revealed in the scriptures. And our lives been energized here and now by the power of the Holy Spirit 
are just part of the promise that God is making all things new. You know, well, in Revelation 21, verse 5, listen to what it says there. It says, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. You see, the gift of salvation is the most wonderfully multifaceted gift that has ever been given. Yet all have refused to unpack many of the facets that seem foreign or don't necessarily suit our own fancy. I'll tell you, God showed me how he uses chains in scenery in our lives to arrest and get our attention and change our perspective. Have you ever become deeply aware of God's patience in your life? Have you ever become aware of his presence in your life? You see, despite my ignorance and resistance at times, God faithfully keeps giving me and you chances to understand and welcome the reach of his saving power. I want you to know more about this gift of salvation. I don't want to confine it or to it to be comfort about the afterlife or condemnation. You see, free living in the present. I want you to know more about it, what it truly means to be saved by grace through faith. The only way that you and I can experience that type of life that we all long for, the life that is woven into the fabric of our very being is to reimagine what it means to be saved by grace through faith. I don't know how many of you have really ever thought and focused on that. I want to challenge you to pray about that and ask God to show you what he wants to show you concerning that. The next thing I want to talk to you tonight is the term sola gratia, which means or equals grace alone. Colossians 1 verses 5 and 6 says, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Grace, a powerful word. We love talking about it. We love singing about it. We even like maybe even writing about grace because it's something miraculous. Grace does what we could never do. Grace does where we, it goes where we could never go. And there has been, I don't know if you've noticed, a resurgence kind of about great teachings over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years. And these teachings have helped many people move past condemnation and shame and guilt, which is a good thing, don't get me wrong. But did you ever feel like you needed to get saved every time you went to church? You see, maybe the messages tended to be a little harsh to you. And I think some preachers measured their success based on how many people rededicate their life and hold their hands up during the service. Did you ever leave a service believing God was just looking for a reason to send you to hell? You see, obviously, this is not a healthy way for anyone to view someone or God. Our Heavenly Father doesn't want us to live in fear and guilt. In fact, the most repeated command in the scriptures is do not fear or fear not. 
God wants you and I to live with courage and with faith, expecting his best for us in our lives. In fact, we are told to approach his throne, the throne of grace, with boldness, not because of anything that we've done, but because of who he is. We are worthy of his grace because of what Jesus did. Our worthiness is a derivative of his life. Listen to what Hebrews 4, 16 says. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and grace. You see, God is not trying to hide grace from us at all. He wants us to actually be overwhelmed by it. As it says in the Gospel of John, verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 16, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. There's another one to think hard about. Grace upon grace. Multifaceted grace is what we're talking about here. God's transcendent grace is available to all of us without measure. And when reading the New Testament, you and I should notice the majority of the letters that are written with a blessing of grace, as in 1 Peter 1, 2, which says, May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Grace is a good thing. It comes from the good Father. You may have heard some people commit that their, comment that there is too much teaching on grace in the church today, and this imbalance gives people a license to sin without feeling bad. And I've heard people refer to these grace teachers and their teachings as hyper or extreme grace. And there is some fact in what is said about those that misinterpret the scriptures. I can think back to a home Bible study years ago in our first home and uh, my wife had a cousin that was attending and he was born again and he was new in the Lord. And I remember teaching some scriptures. We were going through um, one of the particular books. I can't remember exactly which one. And, and he just, we read this section of scripture and I explained it. And then he says, well, well then uh, I can go out and, and go to the bars and dance and God has to forgive me. And I had to explain to him, no, it doesn't work like that. You see, we shouldn't try to take advantage of grace. Grace is a good thing, and it does come from a good father. You see, in truth, we haven't even come close to the extremities or the hyper state of grace's nature. The words hyper and extreme imply a measure that is greater than reality. If grace emanates from the fullness of God, then there's no way we could somehow exhaust its depths or use it all up. You see, we need more teaching on the grace of God. Yes, not less. We actually undersell grace, I believe, at times. And a grace that is undersold leads to a sloppy grace. You see, a grace devoid of imagination, a grace that saves you and I from hell in the future, but abandons you to hell in the here and now. A grace that presents a cure for a human condition, but then throws that cure out the window. Such grace and such a gospel is not worthy of God. Grace can open our eyes to the real us, the life we have in Christ Jesus. Listen to Galatians 2.20, and it says, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You see, in Christ, we have a new identity, and we will not experience the spiritual life that we were made for until we embrace this new identity. 
You see, the false self, in a sense, must be crucified so that the new self infused with Christ's spirit can emerge. Listen to Matthew 16, verses 24 through 26, where it says, Then Jesus said to his followers, If people want to follow me, they must give up the things they want. They must be willing even to give up their lives to follow me. Those who want to save their lives will give up true life. And those who give up their lives for me will have true life. It is worthless to have the whole world if you lose their souls. They could never pay enough to buy back their souls. Now, I know for many of you, you're probably reading a different version, but there's a perfect purpose in reading that particular version. You see, Jesus repeatedly tells us that we find life only in death. And on the surface, this is kind of a cryptic message or remark in a sense. It's kind of a, a shadow of the unique brilliance that God <coughs> for each of us has. And as usual, C.S. Lewis, I don't know how many of you <coughs> read him, he articulates this beautifully. Listen to what he said. The more we get, we know we now call ourselves out of the way and let him take us over, the more truly ourselves we become. There is so much of him that millions of little Christs are all different, will still be too few to express him fully. Our real selves are all waiting for us in him. <coughs> it is when I gave myself up to his personality that I first begun to have a real personality on my own. Until you have given up yourself to him, you will not have a real self. Sameness is to be found most among the most natural men. How glorious different are the saints. In Christ, we don't lose our individuality. We find it reborn and infused with God's DNA. If we are to become saints, we must let go of our old self. You know, the old man or the old woman that it talks about in the Word of God. There is no middle ground. You see, sloppy grace refuses to acknowledge our new creation reality in Christ. It will pacify or manage the old self, but not awaken our true new self, you know, the new creation in us. Sloppy grace causes people to reduce the gospel to moralism, making people feel condemned for not living as they should. And alternatively, it allows them to create a self focus reality in which how they live doesn't matter because Jesus was righteous for them. You see, both extremes release the individual from any love-oriented missional re responsibility that extends beyond the confines of a small, false, old self existence. You see, we want to allow God to change us. And let me make something very clear tonight. We will not feel alive until we align ourselves with the person and the work of the real life. And that is Jesus. You see, the real true self, which is transcendent of both God and us, it is like a new life that only expands as it flows. Don't allow a a false grace to make your life small. Grace should enlarge our lives, introducing a greater vision of who we are in Christ. And this vision will create tension, but that's okay. You see, with, with it comes hope, and, and you cannot have hope without tension. In fact, the only way to eradicate tension is to abandon hope and a life 
without hope is no life at all. You see, we need to live in the tension. You know, through pain and joy, we will awaken God in a sense within our life. That is the design and the purpose of God's grace in our lives. It connects us to the person of Jesus, positioning us to feel what he felt and do what he did. You see, we will never do the greater th works that Jesus actually spoke about in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 12, until we abandon our old false self and put on the new true self recreated in his righteousness, not of, of our own, and his holiness, not of some holiness we think we're creating ourselves by going through religious motions. It says in Ephesians 4, 21 through 24, when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, the gospel is good news. It is the revelation of God's grace, which will reshape our world when we, as Christ's people and as ambassadors here on the earth and as pilgrims here on the earth, under, when we understand the grace of God in truth, as in Colossians 1.16 says. In other words, lives will change when we are willing to welcome grace in all of its beauty and wonder. And to do that, we will have to go beyond ourselves and tap into the mysteries of the cross and its implications in our lives. I like what this one version that I ran across, it's actually the first time I've ever mentioned it. It's called the TPT. And uh, I know most of you don't know what that means, but it is the passion version. And this is the wonderful message that is. This is the way it, it says this in Colossians 1.6. Powerfully changing hearts through the earth, just like it, was changed, it has changed you. Every believer of this good news bears the fruit of eternal life as they experience the reality of God's grace. So how do we do that? How do we experience God's grace. Well, let's go back to that food I was talking about in the beginning. You know, I talked about slop, but let's talk about real food. You see, I have now been in the church, I realized this, about half of my natural born life. Many people who grew up in a Christian home, which I didn't really, have become disillusioned with the church probably get a lot of amens to that. And more and more young Christians leave the church as they begin to enter adulthood. And there's a reason for that. And from what I've seen, it's not any better from those that have spent uh, a lot of their childhood literally in the church because of maybe their parents being in ministry. Well, let me tell you that being on the inside... <laughs> doesn't change much because those kids have seen and heard things that cannot be unseen just like some of us when we see what goes on in the kitchen we may not decide not to eat that food but in reality the kitchen ha is not the sustenance it is a place that prepares the food packages the food and presents the sustenance but it's not the food 
You see, we should not refuse sustenance because of a bad experience with the kitchen. You see, this is the same as refusing to eat because you once had a bad experience at a certain restaurant. As we close up tonight, let me say this as we move forward. I want to invite you to ask God's spirit to remove any prejudices or preconceived ideas that you could keep from eating the spiritual food and experiencing the life that God has for you. You see, those type of mindsets could have been caused by the dynam dynamics in your home or in your church or at school or at work. But the very things that the enemy uses to diminish our view of God and the real true life he has for us God can and God will redeem to bring us into the richness and the fullness of salvation. And in closing, let me say where you've been or what you've seen or what you've done tonight in a new day. You see, God's promises are alive and they are active in your life. But first, you must believe in their existence. Then you can experience their power. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your goodness. And we thank you, God, that you do have saving power, God, that despite us, Lord, tonight could be the day of salvation or the night of salvation for someone. We pray tonight, Lord, in a sense, the light bulb would go on in someone's spiritual mind and they would realize that they can't hide anymore, making excuses of because maybe what their parents did in front of them or how they raised them or the bad examples they were, because that will do nothing but hinder their spiritual life. I pray tonight would be the night. Lord, where they would let that all go, they would lay it at your feet. And tonight they would begin that new life and allowing you to become grace in their life, not holding on to bitterness or the things that are not of you. And we just pray and ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. We all agreed by saying, Amen. <laughs>